Okay, <laughs> welcome again. And uh, I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease and how to control tremors and improve movement with food choices. Food has a large effect on Parkinson's disease. I'm going to tell you about how food can interfere with the transport of tyrosine and levodopa, and this reduces dopamine production. When you quit interfering with these, dopamine production can increase and the uh, amount of dopamine made in the brain can increase, thereby potentially cutting tremors and slow movements in half. This is exciting because you have direct control over how well the levodopa carbidopa is working and how well your body is making its own levodopa from tyrosine. Also, it's very important that we look at how Parkinson's disease started to develop in people and how we can stop it from progressing and developing further. And a large part of this is neurotoxins that are in food, and we can avoid largely those neurotoxins. The idea with this is that you may not see an immediate change in symptoms, but we can slow the progression of the disease so that we don't get worse. When I keep the dopamine producing brain cells alive, that's a lot of the purpose of this talk today. I read a lot of studies and my favorite studies are ones that look at clinical trials where they have some people do this and some people do that and they see what works and doesn't work. Now, a lot of the studies look at risk for Parkinson's disease. In other words, if people eat a certain food and their risk goes up, what's happening? That food, say cheese, for example, may harbor contaminants such as the organochlorine pesticide lindane. And this pesticide can kill off the dopamine producing cells in the brain. This can happen before the disease is diagnosed and after the disease is diagnosed so that it can increase progression of the disease. As you lose more dopamine producing cells, your symptoms are likely to get worse and you'll need more of the drugs to help you along and that can lead to side effects. So my goal here is to let you know which pollutants can kill these dopamine producing cells and also we have defenses against our brain cells dying, mostly antioxidant defenses. And the two types of antioxidants are antioxidants that come from food, such as carotenoids, vitamin E and vitamin C, and polyphenols. And then there's the antioxidant enzymes that our bodies make, which are still dependent on food for the minerals that support these antioxidant enzymes. They just don't work without selenium, zinc, copper, and manganese. You'll see at the bottom of this screen and most of the screens that I have for you today, a reference uh, to a study. All of my information is based upon good scientific studies. And I want you to know that that is the case. And also you can look up these studies and read them yourself and verify what I'm telling you or go deeper into a certain area. Inside the brain, down near the bottom, it's something called the substantia nigra. It's shown in orange in this screen. The substantia nigra is where dopamine is made and then sent through axons into the striatum, which is just below that. There's a part of the substantia nigra called a, uh, that makes the dopamine and runs down into the striatum that controls movement. So this orange part is the substantia nigra, the pars compacta is in that, and that sends axons, which are the output of neurons, down into the striatum to control movement, to make your walking smoother, your tremors less, uh, if you have enough dopamine. And that's kind of the goal of what we're gonna do today. Uh, as I mentioned, this neurodegeneration, the loss of dopamine producing nerves can happen well, decades before Parkinson's disease is diagnosed. So we want to not only work with people with Parkinson's disease, but anyone listening today can reduce their risk of getting Parkinson's disease and quite dramatically as you'll see as I go on. The drug used for Parkinson's disease is almost universally 
levodopa, often with carbidopa, and I'll show you why they add that. The levodopa is a precursor to dopamine. When it goes into the brain, our brains can make dopamine with levodopa. This is the standard therapy, but it does not slow neurodegeneration. It does not protect dopamine producing cells from dying. What I'm gonna tell you is a lot about how to protect your dopamine producing cells from dying, from being lost, any more of them. If you're diagnosed, it, chances are that you've already lost 50 to 60% or even more of those dopamine producing cells. So let's keep the rest of them because we need them. Dietary antioxidants are really helpful. And uh, I'll tell you more, I've got a whole section on that. So the first section of this talk today is how we can produce dopamine from tyrosine and levodopa. Now, many of you have heard of levodopa and uh, Cinemet is a common brand name for that. Tyrosine is an essential amino acid that's found in food, in protein foods. Uh, all foods have some protein and some more than others. But tyrosine is one of the essential amino acids. There are eight essential amino acids for adults. And we can make our own levodopa with tyrosine if conditions are right. Uh, on screen you, here, you'll see my Parkinson's disease dietary regulation of dopamine book. That's available on my website below, drsteveblake.com. Also, my wife, Catherine Blake, has written a book, Parkinson's Disease Cookbook. And these delicious recipes will help to implement the changes that I'm talking about, because many of them are with food. So how is dopamine made? Okay, here's a little diagram that I drew. Uh, we can start with levodopa as a drug, and that can then supply levodopa to the brain. But the transfer of levodopa as a drug into the brain is inhibited by excess protein. And I'm gonna show you how much excess protein most people eat coming soon. Also, tyrosine as an amino acid is eaten in the diet and tyrosine hydroxylase is an enzyme that creates levodopa in the brain. Now, you don't need to learn a lot of technical words for this talk, but try and remember tyrosine hydroxylase because that one's really important. There are certain things that interfere with it and destroy it and certain things that make it work better. But again, this tyrosine transfer into the brain to become levodopa is inhibited by excess protein. Once you've got levodopa in the brain, we have a enzyme that can convert levodopa into dopamine. And the carbidopa that is often taken with the levodopa prevents the step. It prevents levodopa from becoming dopamine, but the carbidopa doesn't enter the brain. It can't cross the blood brain barrier. So the carbidopa stops the levodopa from being used to make dopamine outside the brain, but does not interfere with it inside the brain. And then once you have dopamine made in your brain, it can be used and it can also be degraded. Uh, the monoamine oxidase degrades it. There are some drugs that inhibit monoamine oxidase, so you degrade less dopamine and there's more remaining. Higher levels of protein can block levodopa entry into the brain 50%. Even if your blood concentrations of levodopa are quite high and completely adequate, if it can't get into the brain, then it's not gonna do you any good. All of the essential amino acids, except lysine, are large neutral amino acids, and they compete with levodopa for entry into the brain. They also compete with tyrosine for entry into the brain. So when you take the levodopa as a drug and you eat food as tyrosine, these need to be transferred from the intestine into the bloodstream. And this is done with the large uh, neutral amino acid transporter. This transporter gets busy, like a freeway gets busy at rush hour and not enough of the tyrosine and not enough of the levodopa can enter the bloodstream. The same roadblock, happens when the blood comes near the blood-brain barrier and you want to get this tyrosine and levodopa into the brain to control the tremors, to improve your movements, but it can't go in because you've eaten too much protein. Now, you need a neurologist, a movement specialist neurologist, if you have Parkinson's disease, to adjust your dosage and to 
diagnose and to con help you control the problems with Parkinson's disease. However, American neurologists do not generally study diet. They do not generally study amino acids and protein. They do not generally study medical plants or prescribe them. So what I'm gonna tell you today is in addition to what your neurologist may tell you, and feel free to discuss this with your neurologist, anything that I may say. One interesting thing is in, in the studies that I look at where they lower protein and people's movements become better, most of these studies, they have to actually reduce the levodopa dose because people don't need as much levodopa if they're not getting excessive protein. Isn't that interesting? Now, everyone talks about protein as if it's something we really need and we need more of. We need 46 grams a day. This is a standard established by the US, many other countries, the World Health Organization. It's, it's really quite common that we need about 10% of our calories as protein. And this works out to about 46 grams for adult humans, okay? So we need 46. The standard American diet is 149. The Atkins diet, 122. The zone diet and paleo diet are about 140. The bulletproof diet is 235. That's almost 200 grams of excess protein interfering with the absorption of tyrosine and levodopa into the brain, interfering with your ability to move. Well, haven't we heard that you can eat too little protein? What about on a vegan whole food diet? Is that under 46? No, 74. These analyses are done by myself with the software of the diet doctor that I developed based on the US Department of Agriculture data from the food composition database. So these are very accurate representations of how much protein real people get on these diets that are all fairly common. A vegetarian diet, 109. Mediterranean, 100. Uh, the raw vegan diet, which you would expect to be low, and there's actually variants of it that can be low, one variant ever I've tested, uh, but the generally 81. If they're eating a few nuts and seeds and sprouted beans, the protein is fine. So you can see from this that we're all getting too much protein, even vegans unless you're careful and eat specially. My wife's health cookbook can really be helpful with that. Now, here's a, a series of four studies and they reduce the protein per day to 56 grams. Okay, not quite down to 46, 35 grams. Now that's not enough protein per day. I don't recommend going under the 46 grams per day, but it's very, very unusual for people to get less than that. Did you know that a a serving, say two cups of spaghetti with nothing on it, has about 21 grams of protein out of the 46 that you need per day. So you can see how easy it is to exceed your protein. And oh, don't make the mistake of thinking proteins only in animal products. Beans and grains, for instance, and nuts have protein in them. And this needs to be considered when calculating your total protein intake. Another of these studies do 77 grams and another 63 grams. Okay, all of these are well below commonly eaten amounts of protein. The response rate, 100%, 100%, 100%, and 100%. All people on Parkinson's disease in these four studies responded very well, and they had to reduce the dose of levodopa because they're responding so well to the lowered protein. This is from a great study in Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience, 2017. Now there's a protein redistribution diet. A lot of people don't wanna change their eating habits. And this is, this is very common. Uh, with Parkinson's disease, however, once people try changing their eating habits, they often will continue because the results are so good. So this variant of lowering protein is where you eat less protein for breakfast, less for lunch, and then at dinner time, eat the usual excess of protein. So, after breakfast or before breakfast, you take your, hopefully you should be taking your levodopa medication away from meals because of the protein. But the breakfast protein, because it's small, won't interfere with that levodopa and tyrosine from the food so that more of it enters your brain and you have less problems, less off time, less problems walking, less tremors. 
Again, lunch, you're eating less protein. So you have less interference with your drug, less interference with your own making of levodopa from tyrosine. So you're feeling good in the afternoon. You can move around better. And then at dinner time, eat lots of protein, it interferes with your medication. Typically people are more sedentary in the evening and tremors are less problematic. And then you go to bed. So <laughs> this is a redistribution diet and it can be helpful. Response rates for this average about 80%. And uh, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? It, it is just amazing. What these people did on these studies was eat very little protein, just seven or 10 grams of protein all day until dinner time, and then they ate too much. And the response rates were excellent, 100% and one of them in the 80s, a couple of them in the 60%, so two thirds to three quarters of the people in these studies. What does that mean for you? It means that were you to try a protein redistribution diet, in other words, eating heavy protein only at dinner, but not the rest of the day, you have a good chance of reducing tremors and getting more on time until you eat your heavy protein and it interferes with your ability to create dopamine and have that help you. This is a fascinating study done by Luciana Baroni in Italy. She had already worked with these patients and gotten their protein down to 67 grams per day, which as you can remember from my graph, that's below any of the diets that I showed you. 67 is, is uh, already lower than most people are going to eat on almost any diet. And then during the study, she reduced the protein down to 49 grams per day. Remember, that's more than the 46 grams needed. So it's adequate. It's not a low protein diet. It's an adequate protein diet, but not excessive. What happened? Amazing the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale doubled. It went from 25 to 47. So it virtually doubled. So that means half the tremors, twice the walking speed. In other words, all of their symptoms got better. And uh, how long did this take? One month. And I've seen results even quicker. Isn't that fascinating? So here's a way to cut your tremors and your slow walking and your cramping and all of the problems that this disorder can have in half. And that can be done in weeks to months. And it's done simply by changing what you eat. This study looked at plant diets reported in the prestigious journal Neurology. The plant diet helped after only one week both tyrosine and levodopa were more effectively absorbed and transported into the brain to increase dopamine production. They did need to reduce the drug levodopa, cinnamon in the study, uh, because the, there was less needed. And as you may know, if you get excesses of levodopa as a drug, then that can cause side effects such as dyskinesia, which are, are kind of erratic rapid movements that are not too controllable. So this, if you do start eating less protein, you may wanna work with your neurologist and you know, let them know that you may be needing less frequency of dopa, levodopa and perhaps less dosage of levodopa and see if you can get the go ahead to adjust that. Well, fluctuations in symptoms in this were less too. Fluctuations are, uh, for people who aren't familiar with this, uh, if you take your medication, say in the morning, and then uh, a couple hours after breakfast, the medication starts wearing off before you take the next one and you're experiencing symptoms again. This is called a fluctuation or an off time. And the fluctuations were reduced with this plant-based diet. One of the reasons why that was reduced is because of fiber. The plant fiber slows the absorption of the amino acid tyrosine and the drug levodopa so that it's gradually put into the bloodstream, gradually put into the brain, and you make dopamine over a longer period of time. And this smooths out the fluctuations. Not only does more fiber help, and fiber is only found in plants and is most abundant in whole plant foods, uh, 
this picture of broccoli here is an example, or is that parsley? Anyway, some leafy green, they all have fiber. Uh, so stable con concentrations of levodopa and tyrosine are what you want, and to lower fluctuations in tremors and rigidity. Now, one problem that many people have with Parkinson's, especially as it goes on, is constipation. And fiber helps tremendously with constipation too. So this is another of the real benefits of a plant-based diet for Parkinson's disease, especially a whole food plant diet. Here's an interesting study was done in Brazil. They cut out red meat, which is very big in Brazil, and they added vitamin B2, riboflavin. Motor skills improved 50% in the first three months and then up to 60% in six months. That's a tremendous improvement, isn't it? They did use uh, some vitamin B2, not a huge dose, a reasonable amount. On uh, riboflavin recharges glutathione peroxidase, slowing damage to dopamine, dopamine producing neurons. The word dopaminergic means dopamine producing. But this is for long-term reduction of risk of progression, whereas the cutting out the red meat is what made the big difference in the improvement in motor skills. <clears throat> Red meat can kill neurons through oxidation and glycation. And I'll talk more about this as we go on. When you fry or broil or barbecue meat or chicken or fish, and you produce damaging advanced glycation end products. These are also found in aged cheese. Also, you find oxidized cholesterol. Oxidized cholesterol is also found in red meat and pork and chicken and fish, and oxidized cholesterol is found too in cheese, and oxidized proteins too. They did find when looking at people with Parkinson's disease that these advanced glycation end products, AGE here, were higher, one and a half times higher in Parkinson's disease. And this is not a good idea because this creates inflammation and oxidative destruction of dopamine producing cells. The most dangerous were processed meats like sausages, cured meats, chicken meat, and pork or beef patties. Pretty much covers the, the levels here. Uh, this is based on two 2020 studies. Um, one is foods with potential pro-oxidant and antioxidant effects involved in Parkinson's disease, excellent. And another one is advanced glycation end products and carb protein carbonyl levels in plasma reveal sex-specific differences in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. I've studied and worked with and done a clinical trial with Alzheimer's disease, and we did limit the advanced glycation end products to uh, get improvement in that problem. So which diet is gonna be perfect for Parkinson's disease? Uh, I recommend my wife's cookbook, Parkinson's disease cookbook. By the way, both of these books are available on my website, drsteveblake.com for under $10 to make them available to you in ebook format. So I don't want price to be a problem for anyone. If you can't afford the $10, email me and I'll make sure you get a copy. I'm here to help you and to serve you. People in the later stages of Parkinson's disease often become too thin. Now, part of this is a tremendous amount of calories burned because of tense muscles. And tremors burn a lot of calories too. Uh, so people tend to be too thin and a hearty diet is needed when people are needing this many calories. So for instance, uh, we worked with a man called Gus and he was, his wife was feeding him bacon and eggs and hash browns for breakfast to bulk him up to, because he was too thin. And she was doing the best she knew for him. And we suggested that he change his diet and become more plant-based. Well, a month later, we saw him again and we asked him if he changed his diet. Well, he only changed breakfast. He switched that breakfast over to oatmeal with avocados and berries and, uh, and I think he put almond milk in there too. So he was having a good, delicious breakfast that had a lot of calories and helped bulk him up, but it didn't have the protein levels or a lot of the contaminants that I'll talk about later. And so we asked his wife, how is he doing? And she said, well, 
he's improved about 25% both in movement and in thinking clarity. We said, how long did it take, you know, with a change of diet before he noticed anything? She said, well, it wasn't until the next day. What do you think of that? That's quick results. Usually it takes up to a week, but he, he was obviously encountering huge problems with all that protein at breakfast, making his medication hardly work at all. I, I've heard many people say things like, well, I had a steak at dinner and my medication didn't work at all. You may have experienced something like that yourself. So limiting protein intake to the RDA, 46 grams a day, and that's from all sources, not just animal products, but the amount of protein in grains and beans and nuts needs to be accounted for too. Uh, it's a safe and effective strategy. And you can provide plenty of calories on a diet like this, but without the excess protein. And this, this is how I can help you. Your neurologist is, probably doesn't have time to explain this to you. And your neurologist probably hasn't studied food as much as I have. Will people change their diet? I work with people with various problems. People are at high risk for heart disease if you suggest that they change your diet, they often don't change it because they're not getting any symptoms until the heart attack kills them. But with Parkinson's disease and with arthritis, when people change their diet, they notice life-changing differences. So Parkinson's patients can experience almost immediate relief and within a week or a month from their motor symptoms and thinking difficulties. This makes dietary changes more acceptable. We worked with a wonderful man uh, who was in his late 70s when we met him, and he'd had Parkinson's disease for 35 years. And he was a professor and loved to putter around in his carpentry shop, but hadn't been able to even go into his carpentry shop for 10 years because of his movement difficulties. And his wife reported, we plan to continue the diet, and it has been helpful to discover that it's not as hard to do as we anticipated. There's nothing like good results to keep us motivated. Made us feel really good that he was doing better. He was back in his carpentry shop doing little projects and tinkering around. His hands were calm enough to do that. <laughs> this guy was on medications every hour of the day, several different ones. But they were working instead of not working. I want to mention a bean called Mucuna prurians. This bean naturally contains levodopa, the same levodopa that's in cinnamon. The one, it does not contain carbidopa though. It's a bean that has been used throughout the centuries and throughout the world to help control the problems with Parkinson's disease. One study used Mucuna on 60 Parkinson's disease patients for 12 weeks. The Mukuna patients is twice as well on their unified Parkinson's disease rating scale and twice as well on the Hohen and Yarn scale. These are the two scales that we use to determine how people are doing. But they had to take six 7.5 gram doses of this bean powder every day. Uh, that's about a quarter cup or looked at another way, 48 capsules. So if they're taking it four times a day, that's 12 capsules of this bean powder at a time. And it has been noted in this study and many other studies on Mucuna purians that taking so much of a bean powder can be disturbing to the digestion. In other words, gastrointestinal problems, usually ranging from mild to moderate, not terrible, but still enough to put people off both from, dare I say, choking down so many uh, capsules, or they, they have other ways of taking large amounts of powder. Uh, another study showed that le the levodopa from Mucuna purians, the bean, had a greater bioavailability than levodopa. So it showed a more rapid onset of action in pa patients and just a slightly longer duration of, to limit off times afterwards. Tolerability was acceptable, but there were gastrointestinal effects. Now, one of the problems I already mentioned, dyskinesias that can happen, especially with overdosing with levodopa, um, were not found with mucuna. And so for people with dyskinesias, it's, it's, they're curious, well, should I try levodopa? I should try mucuna purians instead of levodopa. Is it certainly something to discuss with your neurologist? 
Now, on the basis of these two studies and many others, I have not been recommending mucunapurians be difficult to switch over, get the dosage right, and no one wants to eat that many pills or have gastrointestinal disturbances. And then I found this fascinating study. There are many areas in the world that are rural and people are poor and they cannot afford medication for Parkinson's disease. They simply can't afford cinnamon. They're not gonna get levodopa from a drug because they can't afford it. So this group went and they, they had the people actually grow the beans, okay? And then the seeds were roasted in a pan for 15 minutes. They peeled them, ground them up and sifted them to obtain the powder. All of this can be done with hand tools. You, you can use a, you know, a mortar and pestle to grind the powder and a sieve to sift it out and peel it by hand. This powder was added to a glass of water and left sit for just 10 minutes. Now, when people drank the water, but they didn't drink the bean powder, so it was very well tolerated, no problem. They found about two thirds of the levodopa in the mucuna purians powder prepared in this fashion was absorbed into the water and when people drank it was absorbed into the people. And there was no competition from protein from the beans and there were no gastrointestinal disturbances at all. They did have to increase the dosage of the mucuna purians because uh, only two thirds was absorbed instead of all of it. Um, but the people grew the beans themselves. Now, it's something to consider, something to think about. I'm not saying immediately switch over, don't do that. Uh, you could, however, consider talking to your neurologist. Now, times when this might be reasonable, I can think of only two times that people might consider switching. One is at the very beginning of Parkinson's where you hardly need the levodopa at all. It's possible that if you could go with mucunapurian water for a period of years and put off your need for the medication, then that might be a good thing. Because you see over time, over the years, over the decades, more and more levodopa is needed, especially if you're letting your dopamine producing cells die. And I'll tell you more on how to preserve them. But more is usually needed and dyskinesias and other side effects can develop. So if you can put off for a period of time, your need for the drug, that's one time when you might consider mucunapurians and discuss that with your neurologist if you can do that. Another time might be if you're having really severe problems with dyskinesias, and it may be possible that this form of mucunapurians could be helpful with that. But again, I, I advise caution on this and uh, definitely don't try it by yourself. You're gonna need assistance from your movement specialist neurologist in order to adjust the dosage of the mucuna and perhaps also levodopa. The Neuroscience Nutrition Foundation was founded to work with neurologic disorders, not just Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, but migraines. By the way, I'm giving a talk tomorrow on migraines. If you know someone who gets migraines, there are 1 billion people on the planet who get migraines and they can be very disabling. So tomorrow at the same time, I'll be giving a talk on migraines, also very comprehensive, this is my style. Uh, if you'd like to support our work, you can go to this neurosciencenutrition.org and make a donation, very much appreciate it. Uh, I'm volunteering my time today and I volunteer my research time quite frequently. Thank you. Now, I'd like to talk about foods that reduce the risk and progression of Parkinson's disease. And especially if you already have Parkinson's disease, let's go ahead and reduce that progression. I have my email down here. This is my personal email and I'm willing to help. Please forgive me if there's a slight delay in responding to you. I, I get a lot of emails, but I would like to help. And if you have a question, there are questions possible after the talk today, that if you have another one later, you can email me. There's a substance in soybeans called genistein, and it protects dopamine production. Shown here, I have the edamame soybeans. I do feel that it's very important from looking at research to eat only organic soybeans because the ones that aren't organic have been sprayed with many different pesticides, typically, uh, including uh, Roundup. Uh, soy genistein, in this study, they used the genistein extracted from the soybeans so they could get exact amounts. 
protected dopamine producing neurons from injury. What's really exciting is, remember the one word I asked you to remember, tyrosine hydroxylase, the enzyme that makes levodopa from tyrosine. Genistein restored this and restored dopamine into the striatum, into the movement areas. This is exciting. Can actually help you walk better. It's also fascinating that other studies are showing there's a little bit of levodopa in soybeans as well. A lot of beans actually contain it. Fava beans contain quite a bit. In fact, enough to where you should be cautious with fava beans, they could interfere with your medication, supplying too much levodopa in some cases. But with soybeans, they don't have enough to interfere with medication. Uh, protein in a cup of edamame is 18 grams, which is about a third of your daily allotment. Soy milk, five grams, which is about a tenth of your daily allotment. So uh, if you're trying to keep your protein down, so, or please, uh, just organic soy and the genistein is remarkable that it can restore tyrosine hydroxylase. So this is something that can be added to your diet. Many, many products contain organic soy. And soy milk is one of the easiest. And I know that some of the people we work with are resistant to drinking soy milk until they discover the Silk Brand chocolate soy milk, and then they get very enthusiastic about it. Here's another common food that contains sesame. Sesame is a heat activated antioxidant found in sesame seeds, tahini, which is made from sesame seeds. It has a dopamine enhancing effect. It increases the biosynthesis of tyrosine hydroxylase so that we can more readily convert tyrosine into levodopa. Remember, this is happening for all of us with or without Parkinson's disease. We're constantly making tyrosine into levodopa levodopa into dopamine and using the dopamine to move smoothly. Now, sesame did more than improve the synthesis of tyrosine hydroxylase and the, and the synthesis of dopamine. It also caused a decrease in oxidative stress. It increased superoxide dismutase, which is one of the key enzymes that we use to protect our brain cells from death. And there are also the three minerals that make superoxide dismutase work, manganese, copper, and zinc and sesame seeds have an anti-inflammatory action. So as you see, the side effects from some of these plant components can be quite positive instead of the adverse side effects that we sometimes see with drugs. I do wanna say that I am not in any sense anti-drug. I am a co-author of Mosby's Drug Guide for Nurses, for example, and have studied drugs as much as, as I can and try to keep up with all the new drugs, although it's virtually impossible. Carotenoids are the colorful component in plant foods. When you see foods that are orange or yellow, especially, they may contain alpha carotene, beta carotene, uh, lycopene. Uh, there are really quite a list of carotenoids in foods. Carotenoids are fat soluble antioxidants. So they're able to protect the fatty membrane of brain cells from death. Those people, with Parkinson's disease in this study, who had more carotenoids had fewer symptoms. They found that higher levels of carotenoids can reduce both the risk of and the progression of Parkinson's disease. So bottom line, eat plenty of organic fruits and vegetables. And uh, the more colorful they are, the better. By the way, green vegetables, even though they're not yellow or orange, contain quite a bit of carotenoids, which is masked by the green chlorophyll pigment, but they're there. Another component of plant food is flavonoids and it's found only in plants. Uh, flavonoids are a subclass of polyphenols and they can reduce the risk and progression. This study was done and looked at over 130, well, it's a little under 130,000 people, 129,617 to be exact. 21 years, they studied them. And those people who were consuming more flavonoids reduce their risk of developing heart Parkinson's disease 40%. What foods have these wonderful flavonoids? Berries, apples, oranges, green beans, onions, other fruit, other vegetables have these protective flavonoids. The flavonoid rich foods protect the dopamine neurons from cell death by oxidation and inflammation 
inflammation in the brain can lead to cell death by oxidation. So we want to keep these dopamine producing cells alive. We don't want to lose another one, whether you're pre-Parkinson's, in other words, don't have it, or you already have been diagnosed. We want to keep these guys alive in our brain. Some reasons why these flavonoids are so protective. They can activate our own antioxidant enzymes, many different methods, mechanisms. They protect cell membranes from disruption, especially the carotenoids. They help keep dopamine producing brain cells alive. That's the key here. And they can restore energy in the brain. A lot of times the dopamine producing cells die because of a lack of energy, because of problems with oxidation in the mitochondria, the tiny energy factories that make energy in cells. Also the flavonoids inhibit inflammation, which reduces the oxidative damage and death of the brain cells. You can find more on this in my book, Parkinson's Disease, Dietary Production of Dopamine at www.drsteveblake.com. Kind of easy to remember. Now berries are especially protective. They use an extract prepared from blueberries, grapeseed, hibiscus, black currants, and mulberry. And these extracts are really rich in anthocyanins and proanthocyanidins. These are both polyphenols that are highly anti-inflammatory. The anthocyanins can actually get through the blood-brain barrier into the brain and guard our brain cells from inflammation and cell death. The blueberry and grapeseed extracts re rescued dopamine producing cells that were in danger of cell death. I like that, they rescued them. Okay, so they were just about to die, but people ate a bunch of berries. I eat berries every day. I do recommend organic berries because in the case of berries, the insecticides are often sprayed right on the berry, um, which is different than say a potato where it's usually sprayed on the surface and the potatoes below. Now here's something very interesting. It has been found that people who smoke cigarettes have a reduced risk of Parkinson's disease. The nicotine actually reduces the risk of Parkinson's disease. So should we all light up a camel? No, please. Uh, cigarettes are highly damaging to our health. Uh, one of the worst things that people can do to their health is smoke cigarettes, so not recommended. However, this study looked at potatoes, tomatoes, and peppers, and they reduced the risk of Parkinson's disease by 19%, and they found that they traced it to the nicotine. Peppers had the biggest protective effect, cutting risk in half. And people who had never smoked cut risk 87%, which is why I have two big red bell peppers up here on top. We're thinking that stimulation of nicotine receptors may be what's protecting these dopamine producing cells and reducing the risk and progression of Parkinson's disease. So once again, bell peppers are on the top 10 list of food sprayed with insecticide. So you wanna get the organic ones, please. Um, they can be any color, but the red ones are delicious. I'm now going to tell you about a medical plant, actually a root called ashwagandha. Ashwagandha has been used and studied in India for many, many centuries. It's also been studied by modern science. There are thousands of studies looking at ashwagandha and how it can help with many neurologic disorders and other problems too. I think that it's fascinating that the original meaning of the word ashwagandha translates to strong like horse. This root tends to help with stamina and strength. It is gentle. In the studies on it, I am not seeing contraindications at any adverse side effects or any drug interactions either. It is a root that can actually be added to soups and stews. Uh, it, it can be made into teas or it can be made into capsules and swallowed. It significantly increases dopamine production in brain cells and was found to alleviate gait disorders. The plant root has been shown to increase antioxidant enzymes. Glutathione peroxidase is one of our main antioxidant enzymes that is used in the brain and elsewhere, which is by the way, dependent upon selenium or it doesn't work. We have to get selenium in our diet somehow. 
It reduced damaging products of lipid peroxidation, such as melondialdehyde, in just seven days of treatment. It may also promote neurite growth, which is fantastic because that means that, that neurites are the processes such as dendrites and axons that come out of the nerve cells. And if your axons to the striatum are growing back and staying healthy, then this is a very good thing for movements. Something to consider, I have known many people who have added ashwagandha to their program and I have seen some improvement and there are many studies looking at ashwagandha too. And I look forward to seeing more. It's more difficult to get good studies with a plant because there's no profit-based funding. Uh, just, nobody's making a lot of money selling ashwagandha. The ashwagandha lobby just isn't really promoting this to the FDA. So that's, but in other countries, they do uh, use ashwagandha very heavily. And so there's some good research coming. Here's another common plant, licorice root. Researchers in Iran used licorice root and tremors were reduced by half in six months. The unified Parkinson's disease rating scale and the motor scores improved 10% while controls worsened 10%. So this is a motor score. The Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale also looks at other aspects such as activities of daily living and thinking abilities. Now licorice root powder is sweet and can be added to tea instead of sugar. It's very easy to add a little bit of licorice root powder and which contains this glycerhesic acid. Uh, the Latin name is glycerhesic glabra. So they, they the extract glycerhesic acid is named after that. And it has some unique polyphenols that can really help. This is another thing that easy to incorporate, just sweeten your tea with licorice instead of sugar. No problem. Oh, here's one more medical plant. We use ginkgo biloba in the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial. Been extensively studied and we did use the standardized extract so that people always got the same amount of the uh, active constituents. Ginkgo helped to restore dopamine levels in the study below in the Journal of Aging Research and Clinical Practice. It restored tyrosine hydroxylate so people could make their own levodopa in the substantia nigra, parus compacta, and the striatum. The neuroprotective effect of ginkgo is reduction in oxidation it can boost our superoxide dismutase and um, reduce superoxide radical production. It blocks lipid peroxidation. That's uh, basically when, when our fats inside our body go rancid. The one possible contraindication with ginkgo biloba is if you're already taking a blood thinner, such as warfarin, Pradaxis, Xeralto, Eliquis, any of the blood thinners, then it's not recommended to also take ginkgo biloba. One of the ways it works is it tends to thin the blood enough to get into the brain in the tiny capillaries to supply brain cells with the blood, the oxygen, the glucose, and the waste removal that they need. And so it's not advisable to take it also with other blood thinners. I'm just gonna mention one combination of two B vitamins and this is not to help with Parkinson's disease, but it's been found that people with Parkinson's disease die from the same heart attacks and strokes that other people do. And reduction of homocysteine is very helpful for reducing risk of heart attacks and strokes. So by adding these two B vitamins, folate and vitamin B12, they were able to reduce homocysteine from high levels as the graph shows or moderate levels down to safe levels you know, very quickly, just five weeks and it, it was down. Now you'll notice that I'm saying folate here instead of folic acid. Folic acid is a synthetic mimic of true folate. Folate is found in food. Folic acid is not found in food. Folic acid is made in a laboratory. And the problem is that if you get too much folic acid, it can increase cancer risk. So I never would recommend or use folic acid, unfortunately, most supplements who supply, which supply B vitamins, supply folate in the form of folic acid. And so I would never recommend those. You see here a bottle of brain and body food 
Um, this was originally made for people who couldn't get into our Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial. And this contains real folate and real vitamin B12 in the methylcobalamin form. I am author of the McGraw-Hill College textbook, Vitamins and Minerals Demystified. And this is available both as a textbook and as an ebook um, from McGraw-Hill or any bookseller. And so I have studied carefully the vitamins and minerals, and I would love it if this textbook would be used in medical schools and nursing schools. But so far, I haven't found a single one who's willing to teach nutrition in America. Isn't that sad? I'm now going to talk about Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia can be a problem in Parkinson's disease. They're clumps of aggregated alpha-synuclein protein inside neurons, and they can be present, not always, in Parkinson's disease, but dementia risk is higher in Parkinson's disease, mostly from these clumps of alpha-synuclein protein. By the way, alpha-synuclein is a necessary part of nerve transmission and is very useful, but when it gets aggregated and clumped, it can cause this problems with thinking and memory. Now, bicolin is a component of skullcapper, and it found, was found to reduce the formation of alpha-synuclein in Lewy bodies. It reduced dopamine depletion, and it hindered the alpha-synuclein aggregation in the Lewy bodies reduce the toxicity of the alpha synuclein in Lewy bodies. Isn't that fantastic? Now, some uh, information about skullcap herb, it's uh, widely available. It uh, can be gotten in organic form. Uh, and you do need to know that skullcap herb can make you sleepy. And this is important to know that you shouldn't take it during the day if you're going to be driving, especially heavy equipment but no cars too. Uh, Skullcap herbs should only be taken in the evening when typically before you're ready for bed. And uh, it does have a way of calming down the neurotransmitters in the brain. And that's nice if you have trouble sleeping. And I know many people with Parkinson's disease that have trouble sleeping and have used a skullcap herb. Sometimes it's very helpful and sometimes it isn't, but it's never harmful. So uh, it's something, to put in your potential arsenal. But reducing the alpha synuclein is a nice side benefit of a sleepy time tea. Here is a um, resveratrol from red grapes. Uh, of course, you can eat the red grapes too. Uh, it reduces Lewy bodies by clearing the aggregated alpha synuclein. Isn't that fantastic? is protective antioxidant enzymes like glutathione that protects dopamine producing cells from cell death. It has its own antioxidant action and many antioxidants in whole grapes. It also, the, the resveratrol protects mitochondria, sustaining energy production that can keep those dopamine producing brain cells alive. I would recommend eating organic whole grapes to get your resveratrol rather than some extract. And it would be safer and healthier than drinking red wine. Now here's a plant that many of you have heard of, turmeric. It decreases oxidative damage and Lewy bodies. It promotes a degradation of alpha synuclein. The curcumin in turmeric is one of the curcuminoids that's most active, curcumin can rescue dopamine producing cells by reducing the oxidative damage to the mitochondria. Remember I talked about that, the energy producing factories, our mitochondria can get damaged and then that can lead to cell death and turmeric helps to prevent this. Uh, excellent study in the journal Antioxidants, Dietary Antioxidants and Parkinson's Disease published 2020, if you're interested in learning more about this. Turmeric also showed a significant improvement in motor performance in this study down here. Now, this study was not a clinical trial, but was a simulated clinical trial. And so it, not as reliable as I'd like, but since turmeric is so anti-inflammatory and beneficial otherwise, I did look at this study and it did cause a significant improvement in motor performance, which could be useful. 
Black tea and green tea can reduce the toxicity of Lewy bodies. And what can you add to that to sweeten it? Well, how about a little bit of licorice? Uh, tea reduced the toxicity of alpha synuclein, so it didn't damage brain cells and cause problems with thinking. And tea has powerful antioxidants. We know the catechols in tea are powerful antioxidants, catechins, excuse me. They can reduce cell death in dopamine producing cells. And in general, population studies have found that black tea and green tea can reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease 25 to 50%. It's a big reduction. Now, I want to talk in this section about inflammatory foods. When I talk with dietitians, they often talk about foods to include, but they often don't look at the damaging aspects of certain foods. And that's something I want to bring to your attention today. Uh, again, my book on Parkinson's disease is available at drsteveblake.com. I hope that you'll read it for more comprehensive information. And it's made available for under $10, so it's affordable. I wrote a paper as lead author called Reducing Neuroinflammation in Parkinson's Disease with Dietary Compounds with several co-authors who helped quite a bit. We need to reduce neuroinflammation. Emerging evidence indicates that chronic brain inflammation can lead to oxidation and death of dopamine producing neurons in Parkinson's disease. This has been very well established. This paper is open source. And if you put the title in Google Scholar, you can download it immediately and read the whole thing. Of course, it's a little technical. Papers are supposed to be a little technical, they like big words. Higher inflammation is associated with poor motor function and poor cognition. Parkinson's patients have an inflammatory index. And when they had a higher inflammatory score, they had more severe motor impairment and reduced performance. And this includes performance of the activities of daily living, such as dressing and eating and moving. Higher inflammation is a problem, but it's hopeful because when they reduced inflammation, this lowered the declining activities of daily living by 54%. In other words, people were able to continue doing what they needed to do to live independently longer with less inflammation. Uh, excellent study here in Frontiers in Neurology from 2021. Here's a graph diagram that I made for the paper. Dietary components can reduce peripheral inflammation, but what I mean by peripheral inflammation is the inflammation in the bloodstream, in the whole body, not inside the brain of the central nervous system. So the LPS is lipopolysaccharides, which I'll introduce soon, and they increase peripheral inflammation, and then that increases brain inflammation. Arachidonic acid, only found in animal fat, I'll introduce that in a minute. AGEs, I mentioned advanced glycation end products, and I will also introduce those more in a minute. These all contribute to brain inflammation, which contributes to the degradation and the death of brain cells in Parkinson's disease. Now, misfolded alpha-synuclein also can contribute to brain inflammation. And I have shown you some good ways to reduce that, safe, well-researched ways. Brain inflammation, of course, leads to more production of cytokines. Uh, there are many cytokines that increase inflammation. These can activate microglia, are kind of police force of the brain. And then the microglia can make more cytokines resulting in the loss of dopamine producing neurons. Oxidation can also result in the loss of dopaminergic neurons. So you get more symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Which things are creating this neuroinflammation? Which things would we like to avoid? Animal fat, arachidonic acid, you may not have heard about it before. I also wrote a college textbook called uh, Fats and Oils Demystified. If you wanna learn all about fats and oils, I know that Udo Erasmus, one of my heroes, is speaking on fats and oils at this conference. And uh, on my website, drsteveblake.com, you can also download my textbook on fats and oils. Uh, arachidonic acid comes only from animal fat. 
we make it ourselves as animals. We, we make arachidonic acid, but we make just the right amount, not, not the amount that would increase our inflammation or any inflammation. But if you eat animal fat, then you do get excess arachidonic acid. This is processed by lipoxygenase enzymes to become hydroproxy eicosatetraenoic acid, one of my favorite words, and then inflammatory leukotrienes. These are powerful inflammatory agents. Arachidonic acid is blocked by aspirin, Advil, and many of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. What if you didn't eat it? Then you wouldn't need the drugs to block the inflammation. This to me makes more sense than eating animal fat and then eating a bunch of drugs with side effects. Arachidonic acid has been shown to increase inflammation and program cell death in the midbrain, the area that dopamine is created. Arachidonic acid also increases the oxidation of dopamine, which can lead to cell death and um, of the dopamine producing neurons. Here's another substance, lipopolysaccharide. When meat, poultry, fish, or milk is cooked, the bacteria are killed. This is necessary, or we die of botulism or some other horrible disease. The leftover membranes of these bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, very common type of harmful bacteria, are known as lipopolysaccharides. When they enter the body, they're known as endotoxins. And they play a huge role in the progressive neurodegeneration and Parkinson's disease. The lipopolysaccharides have been shown to enter the bloodstream of people who eat meat, chicken, or cheese, uh, assisted by the excess saturated fatty acids in these products. They're an important trigger for Parkinson's disease. Lipopolysaccharides can increase oxidative stress, increasing inflammation. There's a direct role of blood lipopolysaccharides on the central nervous system. The central nervous system has surveillance cells in the blood-brain barrier called cluster of differentiation 14, normally just referred to as CD14. And there are receptors that detect that there are, is a bacterial infection. And when they see the endotoxins from the lipopolysaccharides, from the dead bacteria in the animals, they think there's an infection. So they ramp up the inflammation in the brain, increasing the death of neurons in the substantia nigra and the striatum that are necessary for movement. They increase inflammatory cytokines and Parkinson's disease. They stimulate the astrocytes and microglia that are like the police force in the brain. And then they put out inflammatory cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, and many others. Uh, there are a long list of cytokines that are inflammatory and that are necessary for real inflammation, but are only damaging in fake inflammation, which is what your body is seeing with these lipopolysaccharides. The key, avoid animal derived food to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. Simple enough. By the way, I've been avoiding animal derived food for 53 years, so it certainly it's possible. I mentioned advanced glycation end products before. Uh, sources are fried, barbecued, or broiled chicken, beef, pork, or fish, and aged cheeses. These products can increase misfolded proteins in Lewy bodies. They also increase misfolded proteins in tau tangles and amyloid beta that are found in Alzheimer's disease. They greatly increase oxidation and death of brain cells. Now the advanced glycation end products you would think would be blocked from the brain, but no, there's a receptor called RAGE. Isn't that an interesting name? Receptor for advanced glycation end products directly puts these very damaging inflammatory compounds into the brain, correlated with a higher risk for Parkinson's disease. And they've looked at Parkinson's patients, and they have more of these damaging advanced glycation end products in the brain. What can you do? You could avoid meat, chicken, fish, and hard cheese. And this would have the side effect, of course, of less strokes, heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, and so many other things. But more to the point with Parkinson's disease, these can help protect your brain from unwanted inflammation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about dairy products now because they're one of the key ways that your brain can become inflamed and damaged. 
those who consumed three servings of dairy products compared with one serving per day had an 80% increased risk of Parkinson's disease. Now, wait a minute. Why didn't they compare them with people who ate no dairy products? Well, they couldn't find that many. Four cups of milk was found to triple the risk of Parkinson's disease. That's a huge increase in risk, 400% risk. This is from a study in the European Journal of uh, Epidemiology. Now, there's different studies have different numbers, but they're all bad for dairy products. Milk fat increases inflammation. It also reduces uric acid levels. Uric acid is a powerful anti-inflammatory and antioxidant, mostly an antioxidant in the bloodstream. Dairy products also induce insulin resistance for faster progression of diabetes. And they are, the dairy products are often, I would have to say universally contaminated with neurotoxic pesticides. This is true whether they are organic or not organic because of the persistent organic pesticides, which I'll talk more about. For every one slice in this study of cheese consumed, Parkinson's disease risk increased by 36 to 48%. Now you may not have been aware of this before, uh, there are several studies quoted on this page, one in 2019, one in 2020. And here are more studies of boy dairy products to avoid the progression of Parkinson's disease. In this case, dairy products increase the risk of Parkinson's disease 2.3 times. Neurotoxic contaminants are suspected, especially the polychlorinated biphenols, PCBs, and other organochlorine pesticides, these are two. And uh, TCE, trichloroethylene, is also suspected. In this study, people with the lowest dairy product consumption were 60% less likely to get Parkinson's disease. So avoiding cheese and milk, and you see in this picture, a glass of plant milk doesn't have these problems of excess protein, dieldrin and lindane, for damaging organochlorine pesticides, lowering uric acid, endotoxins I mentioned. These may be some of the main concerns with milk. Now there are many, many studies on this. As you see these two vertical dark, vertical light lines in the graph, these are called forest plots. Every study to the right shows an increase in risk with dairy products and Parkinson's disease. And every study to the left of that vertical line shows a decrease in risk, but there are no studies to the left of those lines every single study showed an increase of risk for every participant. And this is over a huge range of different studies. So we're getting pretty sure that dairy products are involved with the risk of Parkinson's disease, not only through neuroinflammation, through many different, many different mechanisms. There are, however, some wonderful anti-inflammatory foods. These will be found in my book or in my recent paper, very recent paper, by the way. Short chain fatty acids from plant fiber are processed to become butyrate, which decreases inflammation, especially in the gut. And that can lead to less inflammation throughout the body. I mentioned turmeric, the curcuminous anti-inflammatory. I mentioned grapes, the resveratrol is anti-inflammatory. Soy products, the genistein is anti-inflammatory. Sulforaphane comes from cruciferous vegetables like kale, broccoli, cabbage. And ginseng reduced oxidation and inflammation and also increases stamina. Vitamin E is shown to have a very strong protective effect. Again, the uh, citations for this research are in my paper and in my book as well. I use citations in my book as well as in the paper. Uh, SAMe, s methionine, increases glutathione to protect the dopamine producing cells. And polyphenols like quercetin found in whole plant foods are also very protective. I want to talk about food contaminants before we finish here. Thank you for being very patient with my comprehensive lecture here today. Which food contaminants increase the destruction of dopamine producing neurons? Don't you want to know this so you can protect your neurons? Whether or not you have Parkinson's disease. I don't think any of us want to progress to a, a problem with our brains. What are the mechanisms? These contaminants can speed up the progression of Parkinson's disease, so let's avoid them. Have you heard of beta methyl, uh, methyl amino L alanine? I'll say that again, beta methyl amino alanine. It's made by cyanobacteria in seawater. 
and may be concentrated in crab, shrimp, fish, or shellfish. Brains from Parkinson's disease patients had high levels of this damaging BMAA, even when compared to Alzheimer's disease and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. By the way, with ALS, they found that in Guam, where people ate a lot of this BMAA, that it directly produced neurotoxic actions and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It can damage and kill dopamine-producing cells and increase Lewy bodies, very damaging. It has a structural similarity to glutamate, the main neuroexcitatory transmitter in the brain. So it can trigger excited toxicity killing brain cells can damage energy production in mitochondria, also killing brain cells, such as the dopamine producing ones. And it can increase protein misfolding in Lewy bodies. Can largely avoid this by avoiding crabs, shrimp, fish, or shellfish, where it's bioaccumulated. Now, harmane is another contaminant of food, usually in fermented foods. This graph shows that the Parkinson's patients with the lowest amount of harmane had more harmane than the highest amount of harmane in people without Parkinson's disease. This by itself is rather telling, okay? People with Parkinson's disease have higher harmane levels. Harmane increases tumor, tremors. And when harmane increases tremors, this is true in essential tremor, which is a problem with millions of Americans and around the world but also with the tremors in Parkinson's disease. Now it's found in some of the favorite things that Americans like, beer. <laughs> 12 fluid ounces has the highest level of total harmane and norharmane. 20 cigarettes, the second highest level. Pork loin, broiled beef, cheese, bacon, and broiled chicken, a favorite in fast food restaurants. All of these are very high in the tremor producing harmane and norharmane. How could you possibly avoid tremors? Well, you could avoid these foods and cigarettes and beer. I certainly do. Home use of pesticides can increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. And you can use a non-toxic alternatives such as boric acid for cockroaches and many other insects, which is non-toxic. Cinnamon, uh, dimitaceous earth for fleas, uh, cinnamon helps with ants, uh, either the spray or the powder. Uh, there are many non-toxic ways to do this. And occupational exposure can increase risk of Parkinson's disease four times, 400% increase. Even home use can increase it quite a bit too. Postmortem studies on Parkinson's patients find higher levels of the organochlorine pesticides. Again, these aren't used hardly at all anymore, but they're in the environment. So they're bioaccumulated into animal fat. And you need to avoid animal fat entirely to avoid these. More animal fat increased odds in this study in the annals of neurology over five times. It, you're eating animal fat at your own risk. And of course, animal fat is also associated with many other chronic diseases, this is obvious but five times the odds risk of Parkinson's disease, I say avoid them. Now they looked at lindane, which is one of the organochlorine pesticides. These are bioaccumulated in animal fat and then bioaccumulated again in brain fat in people. In Parkinson's disease, lindane was higher even than Alzheimer's disease and much higher than controls. Raised the risk of getting Parkinson's disease 4.39 times over normal risk. Typical sources, milk, eggs, and cheese. So I guess you're looking at an omelet here. Um, there are many alternatives to omelets. My wife's cookbook has some just delicious breakfast alternatives. And I highly recommend that you find something else to eat that is not contaminated with lindane, which also has been linked very strongly to cancer. You could eat organic. Uh, organic foods are now are much more available and cheaper. Uh, exposure to pesticides increased risk. What, this study looked at 46 studies and the risk was higher of Parkinson's in all of the studies. Four times, in some cases, even five times the risk where people are getting exposed to a lot of pesticides. Now I wanna talk about polychlorinated biphenols, commonly known as PCBs. They're higher 
in the brains and Parkinson's disease. They can be avoided too, if you know where they are. They accumulate in the brain and disrupt dopamine. They damage cognitive function. But one of the big problems they have is they damage this tyrosine hydroxylase and the aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. This is the enzyme that makes dopamine from levodopa. So it damages both of these. PCBs damage the brain, no doubt, and they're found in animal fat. I'll show you where they're found in a couple slides. Now in 1977, they banned the PCBs. Unfortunately, they're still in the environment. They don't break down. And then they produce polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Well, these PBDEs are just as bad or worse than the ones they replaced. The damage to dopaminergic neurons is strikingly similar to PCBs. And they were found to impair motor function. So let's avoid these things. Where are they found? Fish oil, number one. Fish, number two. Eggs, dairy, and baby food and beef also contain these. They're bioaccumulated fat-loving compounds that get stronger in the environment. So unfortunately, uh, even vegetable oil had a tiny amount of PCBs, but fruits, vegetables, and cereals virtually absent because there's no bioaccumulation in these plant foods. That's one reason why plant foods are safer. They don't bioaccumulate fat loving toxins. Now, some people say, well, I eat organic chicken or I eat organic beef, so I don't get any pesticides, wrong. Even organic meat has polychlorinated biphenyls and organochlorine pesticides. This study in food and chemical toxicology in 2017 showed clearly that not only did organic chicken have as much, but more of these organochlorine pesticides and beef had more, not less of these organochlorine pesticides. So the solution is not to eat organic beef or chicken, it's not to eat beef or chicken. Now, I just will mention mercury. I think everyone knows that mercury is a neurotoxin and it's found in fish. It increases oxidative stress, damages the mitochondria and lowers dopamine production. Another good reason not to eat fish. I'm gonna talk about antioxidants briefly here because we're coming near the end of the talk. But I do wanna mention that people with Parkinson's need more antioxidants because they can increase the oxidation products from excess tremors and movement tightness and neuroinflammation can increase oxidation. So you're gonna need more antioxidant because this oxidative stress can damage the dopamine producing brain cells, as I mentioned. Selenium protects dopamine producing cells. The breakdown of dopamine can lead to hydrogen peroxide and glutathione peroxidase converts hydrogen peroxide into water. It's great, but it can't do it without dietary selenium, which is why I add selenium in a perfect form to the brain and body food. Antioxidants in food, carotenoids, I've mentioned, vitamin C, vitamin E, polyphenols, again, only in plant foods. Carotenoids and polyphenols are only found in whole plant foods. And then our own antioxidant enzymes need zinc, copper, manganese, and selenium. Coenzyme Q10 is something that we make in our bodies and some people take. And we did use it in our Hawaii dementia prevention trial to boost antioxidant activity to protect brain cells. Antioxidants in diets, well, the Atkins was the worst for vitamin E and vitamin C. The standard American diet was very bad for vitamin C and vitamin E, uh, didn't even make half. Uh, many of the diets are low in vitamin E. Uh, the only two that were high were vegan whole food and raw vegan diets. For vitamin C, many of the diets were okay, but again, the vegan whole food diet and the raw vegan diets were the winners for antioxidants. They studied people with um, Parkinson's disease and they looked at when they got a little bit more antioxidants, uh, beta carotene, lowered risk 14%. They gave them six to eight milligrams a day of vitamin E. This is a tiny amount and it's still lowered risk 13%. And they gave them a little bit of vitamin C and it's still lowered risk 9%. Imagine, imagine what you could do with a real multiple with reasonable amounts of these things. So the antioxidants had a protective effect against Parkinson's disease in the Swedish study. Vitamin E in the study, they used a lot of vitamin E and they wisely use it with vitamin C, very important, they work together. 
delayed the progression of Parkinson's disease two and a half years. Um, tremendous um, study in molecular aspects of medicine. Vitamin E and beta carotene were found to reduce the risk. Vitamin E, 55% less risk, beta carotene, 44%. But here's another statistic. 93% of Americans don't get the bare minimum of vitamin E. This may be linked to the epidemic of Parkinson's disease that's going on right now. It's the fastest growing neurologic disorder. Vitamin B6 may be low because the medication actually can reduce the vitamin B6 in the body. So another thing that should be in your multivitamin in the correct form and quantity, vitamin B6 needs to be limited to get only the right amount, not too much. Lower vitamin D levels have been correlated with Parkinson's disease and with worse tremors. So vitamin D supplementation has been found to help. And I think that vitamin D supplementation with vitamin D3, the normal natural form is uh, probably a good idea for most people who don't get a lot of sun. There was even a study here in Hawaii on skateboarding kids who got tons of sun and vitamin D still helped them. I mentioned coenzyme Q10 this is an antioxidant that can be taken by pill form. It's normally made in our bodies. It's a very powerful antioxidant. I'm gonna sum up here, food for Parkinson's disease. Eat plenty of berries, grapes, and other fruits to get protective antioxidants and polyphenols and flavonoids. Increase bell peppers, organic, and organic kale and cabbage. Kale and cabbage have indole-3 carbonyl and sulforaphane, these are powerfully protective. Increase sesame tahini and organic soy products to protect your ability to make your own levodopa to add to the levodopa you may also be taking. Stay away from animal fats and animal protein. Uh, a friend of mine told me that they had cut down on the animal fats and animal proteins. They, they, they had their kids eat less of them. I was so shocked, I compared it to oh, my kids are drinking gasoline, and now they're drinking less gasoline. I have to say, these are very damaging foods, and the research is very concluding, conclusive. Um, buy organic foods to avoid pesticides. Here's my wife's book, Parkinson's Disease Cookbook, highly recommended, and you can find that at my website, drsteveblake.com. Antioxidants are crucial. Make sure you get vitamin C, real vitamin E. I have to caution you that the vitamin E in supplements is almost universally a damaging synthetic alternative, which is not real vitamin E. Get enough selenium, copper, zinc, and manganese. All of these are found in my brain and body food available at drsteveblake.com. Uh, dietary protocol for Parkinson's disease. Remember, if you reduce the protein to necessary levels from the common excessive levels, you may see an immediate reduction in tremors and rigidity. You may even need to talk to your neurologist about reducing your levodopa intake because you won't need as much anymore. Avoid the dietary toxins in animal fat, which means not eating animal products. Increase dietary antioxidants from plants. So the more whole plant foods, the better. In include bell peppers to retain dopamine uh, and reduce Lewy body formation possibly think about turmeric, coenzyme Q10, and skullcap. I have to say that there's much more that I could tell you about Parkinson's disease. Please uh, check out my book, Parkinson's Disease, Dietary Regulation of Dopamine, on my website, drsteveblake.com, and my wife's cookbook and the brain and body food. If you have questions, you can email me, steve at drsteveblake.com. If I haven't covered them in this talk and in the book, then I'd be happy to help you in that way. And with this, I'm gonna say I'm concluding my talk. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you so Thank much, you. Steve, for that really uh, comprehensive presentation. <laughs> That's it's, it's my middle name. Definitely, definitely comprehensive. So we're now gonna begin our live Q&A. Um, I would like to go over uh, you know, a few things about the audience participation. We don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise their hands. If you're not sure how to do this, what you need to do is click on the reactions button, second from the right at the bottom of the Zoom window, and then you click on the raise hand function in the menu that pops up. When I call your name, I will unmute you and prompt you to state your, where you're from and ask your question. And we just ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. And with that, um, so 
just a question about Alzheimer's. I just want to ask you a question before we go to, to some audience questions. Um, you know, this, this was on Parkinson's, but, you know, but obviously within your expertise. So, uh, you know, what are the suggestions for preventing Alzheimer's? And and one of the reasons why I'm asking is because we had uh, Dale Brendanson on and he says that a mild ketogenic diet is best. And then, you know, and then we hear that, you know, Gabriel Cousins says less carbohydrates and more healthy fats is better. Um, and what is, so we all kind of want to get an idea of what your research shows. <laughs> I was on a panel with Dale Bredesen last year on mm -hmm. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And I think that if you want the full answer, go ahead back a year and take a look at that. Uh, no, uh, ketogenesis is not helpful. It's harmful with Alzheimer's disease, a very bad idea. The idea is that the brain cells, they want glucose. It's a preferred fuel. That's what they run on. We all know this. When, our, when we get low in blood sugar, we don't think well at all. In, in our Maui Memory Clinic here, we make sure people have some food in them when we test them or they get very bad test scores. The brain needs glucose to activate. Now, when you eat animal fat, what happens is you increase insulin resistance. And in the brain, that means less glucose can be absorbed. So the brain cells are starving for glucose. So Dale Bredesen's idea is, well, let's give them beta hydroxyglutarate and acetone. These are ketones. Mm -hmm. And these ketones can actually produce energy in the brain. They are not healthful. That's not what the brain wants. But the fats that you're eating with the, all the saturated fat is increasing the problem. Your insulin resistance is getting worse. The ability of your brain cells to take in glucose is getting worse. You're increasing the progression of Alzheimer's disease with perhaps a temporary ability to think clearer because you're burning a few ketones. To me, this is completely the wrong approach. And is that true with, with like healthy plant-based fats like avocados, nuts, seeds, those types of things? Well, first of all, ketogenesis is unlikely to happen on any diet. This is, typically happens only during severe fasting. Mm. Uh, so the concept that you're going to be producing brain energy from ketones is flawed to begin with. But no, this is not a problem with avocados, olives, nuts and seeds, and nut butters. These are healthy fats. Uh, we need to eat you know, not so much that we get fat actually, mm -hmm. but other than that, they're very, very healthy. And they have all these wonderful plant components that I've just been talking about. Right, they're beautiful. All right, our first audience questions is gonna come from Bin Wu. Please state where you're from and ask your question. Yes, thank you very much for the great talk. And um, I come from the Maryland. My question is, can the Pakistan disease reward, be reversed by the diet? I didn't hear that clearly. Can you please relay the question for me? Yeah, can, I see. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Can Repeat Parkinson disease be, um, be reversed by the diet, by the food, by the you know, lifestyle? Can reverse uh, it? Uh, Benmu, ben, do me a favor. Uh, I'm going to take another question. Can you just uh, type it in the chat and I'll, I'll just read it? Because there's a few words that I'm having a hard time hearing you. And I, th I think uh, that, uh, that Steve's also. Okay. Okay. All right. And then we'll go to another question and we'll come back to. Uh, to thank you, Ben Wu. I want to see your question type so I can answer it properly. Okay. Thank you. All right. So going to, oh, give me one second here. Just my computer's not doing exactly what I wanted to. Um, all right. So our next question is going to come from Denise. Denise, where are you from? And what is your question? Hi there, Tucson, Arizona. Thank you. I watched my father suffer from Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Uh, sadly, doctors, I'm sure, told him nothing like you presented today. I was just wondering um, if you had an opportunity to consult with Michael Fox, as obviously everybody knows about him and his struggle, and whether he's doing any of these things that uh, the research has shown. I'd like, I'd be interested in hearing that. Thank you so much for all your wonderful knowledge that you shared. Oh yeah, Michael J. Fox calls me all the time. I'm kidding. Uh, I would love to consult with him. Uh, but uh, so far it's difficult with these foundations. Uh, the funding of the foundation limits their scope of uh, approach. And this I found also with the Alzheimer's uh, Association and many other pharmaceutically funded 
uh, foundations. And so I have not had a chance to work with Michael J. Fox yet. Um, I, if you have some pull there, uh, give him my number. All right. So we'll have someone give him a call on your behalf. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, the next question is going to come from Brenda. Um, if you can unmute your, if you can unmute yourself, you might be on an older version. Okay. Um, stay where you're from and ask your question. Yes. Hi. Thank you, doctor. This is very informative. I have a mother with Parkinson's. I was curious about how to give the curcumin. I do freshly grate it myself in a hot water in the mornings. Um, but do you prefer a supplement? I do put the cracked black pepper as well. And then my second question is, have you noticed she has severe blood pressure fluctuations at times. And has that been anything been described with levodopa? That uh, blood pressure fluctuation is not a common side effect of levodopa. And that's something that needs to be addressed. You should definitely uh, have your doctor look at that. I, I have seen some severe blood pressure fluctuations and, and you should get some help with, with that one. Uh, as far as the turmeric root, uh, grinding it into hot water with a little black pepper is a great way to get it. Uh, the problem with turmeric is that it is very difficult to absorb the curcuminoids. Uh, very little gets into the bloodstream. So my favorite way to do it is with a curry, where instead of using a quarter teaspoon, you're using teaspoons of turmeric in the curry and cook it. And it, it's delicious. And you get lots of curcuminoids that way. So that's something you can do on days when you're not doing the tea. Thank you for your question. All right, so we have uh, we have Bin Wu's question, which is, can Parkinson's disease be reversed by diet? Yeah, well, this this of course is what we would all like to think, but largely not true. Um, I will talk about John. Um, John came to our clinic, uh, the Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience, uh, and which is the largest neuroscience practice in the Pacific. And he saw an excellent movement special neurologist who diagnosed him with Parkinson's disease, early Parkinson's disease. And he tried the levodopa, but uh, he had severe reactions to it and couldn't take it. So uh, he was sent to us and we worked with him with diet and he and his wife did a fantastic job of reversing his Parkinson's disease. And he was a, when we first saw him, he had resting tremors, his face was masked, his posture was stooped. He had all the classic problems of slow gait and so on with Parkinson's. And over a few months, he did get better. This is in very early Parkinson's disease. Uh, once it's advanced more, it's much more difficult to reverse. Uh, cutting the symptoms in half is what I've seen in most of the studies, and that's something we can hope for, but I would say only in the early stages can it actually be reversed. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, I, I'd love to think that that could happen more frequently. And how, comes in, is, how common is it to catch it in the early stages as opposed to the, the later stages? Well, remember that at diagnosis, 50 to 60% of the dopamine producing cells are already gone. But I have to say that John, um, a year later, came to a Parkinson's Association conference on Oahu, where I was keynote speaker. And uh, after they finished clapping for me, um, his wife said, John, follow this program and hold up your hand, John. And he held up his hand and there were no tremors and he got vastly more applause than I did and he deserved it. And his wife too, for following the program. So I have seen it occur, but it is, it is difficult unless you're catching it early. Thank you. So um, kind of go back to um, the the kind of the, the diet thing, you know, a little bit in, into the ketosis world. Why do so? Why is the keto diet so popular? Why do so many authors recommend it? And what does the evidence show? I, I you know, you hit on it in general, you know, kind of that animal products are bad. But, you know, I mean, you could also do a plant-based version of a keto diet. What, you know, what does the evidence show of why it's so bad? Well, uh, the reason why it's uh, recommended is because the people who are recommending it have not analyzed the keto diet for nutrients, clearly, unless they want to hurt people. Uh, had they analyzed it for nutrients, they would see that the calcium intake on the keto diets is extremely low. 
we're talking two or 300 milligrams per day. And uh, recommended for adults is 1,000 to 1,200. And if you're eating a, a lower protein plant diet, the minimum possible recommendation would be 800 milligrams per day, but they're only getting two or 300. And studies have shown more breaks, hip breaks, leg breaks, more osteoporosis in people who follow a keto diet. Uh, I think the reason people like a keto diet is because like any diet that reduces calories, you can lose weight on it. But studies have shown that the weight loss is typically transient and not, not permanent at all. It, it, it doesn't come back. Looking at the other minerals, the magnesium is very low in this diet uh, and that's a big problem. Of course, it doesn't digest well. They try keto diets with children with epilepsy only after three different regimens of epileptic drugs have been tried because they know that it is a desperate attempt to help with epilepsy. I know people say, oh, well, they use it for epileptic children <laughs> only in desperation. If they're refractory to three different drug regimes, then they may institute it. Typically, the children can't take it. The gastrointestinal symptoms are awful. The diet's awful. Uh, it does not satisfy human requirements for nutrients in many, many ways. I, I have analyzed these diets and, you know, I could go over the, the diet. It just, it's amazing um, just how, how poorly the keto diet does with uh, approximating the human need for nutrition. Just analyze your diet if you think a keto diet is good and you'll find out it's not. It's that simple. Perfect. So uh, what can we do to prevent memory loss and get back what we lost? <laughs> well, memory loss is, of course, a, a subject of my Hawaii Dementia Prevention trial that has been published, and uh, as well as the book, Nutrients for Memory, available on my website, drsteveblake.com, where I outline all of the things we did in the Hawaii Dementia Prevention trial that was quite successful, by the way. Uh, there is a scale, a uh, memory scale, the mini mental state exam, that has 30 points possible. 25 to 30 is considered normal. 20 to 25, mild cognitive impairment, and under 20, getting into dementia. So we started with people in the 19, averaging 19 on that scale. And after nine months, they were 27 in the normal range. And what we did in that trial, uh, which lasted nine months, was we, we used 12 nutrients and four dietary changes. And one of the dietary changes was to add uh, berries, either blueberries, strawberries, or red grapes, a cup a day. That's something almost anyone can do. Uh, organic is obviously preferred. Uh, we also added nuts and seeds. We used uh, one ounce of ground walnuts and one ounce of ground sunflower seeds. The sunflower seeds contain the alpha to coferol fraction of vitamin E and the walnuts contain the gamma fraction of vitamin E. Together, they really protect the brain. Uh, we also had people lower their saturated fat, and that's one of the key components of reducing dementia and less emphasized than it should be. Virtually all of the dementia has an aspect of vascular dementia. The clogging of the brain blood vessels from say keto diet, can we say? <laughs> mm. Any high saturated fat diet is going to uh, clog blood vessels. This is just an, you can't have too much saturated fat in the diet. American Heart Association says under 6% of calories, about 12 grams per day. I quite agree. That is a safe level. By the way, when we eat a vegan whole food plant-based diet, I typically get nine to 12 grams of saturated fat a day from the plants. And uh, certainly about as far from keto as I can get. Uh, so that's difficult to get and maintain uh, adequately low saturated fat to prevent brain clogging. People we see in the clinic often get, one guy got 68 grams a day. This is not uncommon. Um, with keto diets, it can be even higher, 80, 100 grams of saturated fat a day. So people are destroying their vasculature, including the vasculature in their brain. And uh, being encouraged um, sometimes by by people who are not experts in nutrition. And you know, we've seen this over and over again. The paleo diet was invented by someone who was an anthropologist. But as far as I can tell, he never analyzed it for nutrition. And the keto diet is kind of an offshoot of the paleo diet. They're similar. 
Daily diet also very low in calcium, magnesium, and many vitamins and minerals too. So to protect the brain, one of the key things, and I did recently write a paper on this topic on saturated fats in, um, let's see, the title of the paper is how excess dietary saturated fats, oh, this one, uh, sorry, I've written quite a few papers read lately. Um, this paper is reducing excess dietary saturated fat intake to improve cognition and vascular dementia. So here we're not just talking about preventing dementia. We're talking about improving dementia by reducing saturated fats. And improving cognition, especially in Alzheimer's disease, when it's advanced, that may be a pipe dream. But in beginning stages of dementia or mild cognitive impairment, or certainly in all of us who don't yet have brain problems, let's go ahead and keep those excess dietary saturated fats out of our diet and improve our cognition right away. And in that paper, I discuss all of the mechanisms and, and there are, uh, as one of my co-author mentioned, more pages of references than there are pages of paper. That's how I like it. All right, great, thanks. Our next question is coming from Carol. Please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Blake, thank you for your time. Um, I need your memory loss stuff because I'm pretty well, I'm scribbling notes here and I'm um, uh, interested about the saturated fats because my mind, my short-term memory is terrible. And, um, but I was going to ask, I was listening specifically because I have a friend that just got Parkinson's diagnosed. I think he had many strokes and different things. I don't know if that's what caused it. I'm unclear on that. Uh, but he's a, very severe celiac um, patient. And I wondered how that comes into play or does it uh, with Parkinson's? It would certainly affect, you know, what he could eat. Very, very strict diet. Sure. And what is your question, please? Um, just wondering with my friend that has Parkinson's being a celiac um how that might affect his, the diet might affect his uh, prognosis with the disease and following your protocol. Well, sure. Uh, with celiac disease, you have to avoid all sources of gluten. That's pretty obvious. And there are many grains that don't have gluten and, uh, you know, many beans and other things that don't have gluten. And in fact, it reminds me, one of the bizarre things about a keto diet is they don't allow beans why not? Their glycemic load is so low. They're really not blood sugar boosters at all. It always confused me. For your friend, um, if, if he wants to follow some of the things I've talked about today that are safe and may improve his uh, Parkinson's disease, then he just needs to adapt it to stay away from all gluten sources, of course. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And our next question is coming from Brenda. Brenda, you have to unmute yourself again. Yes, thanks again. I was just wondering, what do you recommend for washing organic and non-organic fruits and vegetables? Oh, for washing them. Well, you know, it's interesting because most of the studies that look at pesticides in foods, uh, they wash the food before they test for pesticides. So this is after washing that they're testing for pesticides and finding so many. And it's amazing how many pesticides they find in foods. Uh, for washing foods, uh, what do you suggest, Catherine? Well, hello. I'm Catherine. Um, you know, I've been using dish soap, but I also steam and boil foods, which I think really helps with reducing the some of the pesticides, not the ones that are intrinsically in the food really well, but I use dish soap. Uh, sometimes I'll do it twice till they feel really clean in my hands. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. And um, I'm going to ask a question. Um, the Epic Oxford study, um, they said that vegans had a greater level of bone fractures. What are your What are your thoughts on, on that and what might be the cause? Well, the cause is obvious. Uh, I analyze vegan diets all the time and typically they're low in calcium. 
And this is uh, difficult, really, to design a vegan diet that is not low in calcium. So what I do with my own diet, I, having been plant-based for 53 years, I eat foods that are high in calcium, um, and that would include, uh, well, tofu's high in calcium, so organic tofu is one thing. Green vegetables are high in calcium, beans, nuts and seeds. I get all the calcium from food I can, but even so, typically vegan diets are running somewhere between 450 and 650 milligrams per day of calcium. And as I said, even on a low protein diet, protein depletes calcium. Even on a low protein diet, you're gonna need at least 800. So what I do is supplement. The brain and body food that I developed for the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial has extra calcium in it. So it just the one thing takes care of calcium, all the antioxidants and all the other things. It, it kind of uh, covers the bases. I think that vegans need uh, vitamin B12, iodine, calcium. There are a few things that help us become optimally healthy. And if we analyze our diets and find we don't have enough, simple, just take some but take it in the right form because calcium typically is, is uh, calcium carbonate is very poorly absorbed. And so I use the calcium citrate malate in the, my supplement. And uh, what are your thoughts on EPA and DHA? Well, that's a tough question, Michael, uh, because we make EPA and DHA in our bodies from ALA, which is alpha linolenic acid. So the alpha linolenic acid can be gotten from, well, walnuts are actually a good source um, and flaxseed powder. And we do supplement our diet with flaxseed powder so we get enough alpha linolenic acid, the basic plant-based omega-3. And then our bodies are able to process that with the enzyme delta-60 saturase, which makes the one more desaturated spot than elongase. So it's, it's now 20 instead of 18. And then one more delta-5 desaturase reaches in and then now we have made EPA in our bodies. In a similar fashion, we can make DHA, docosahexaenoic acid in our bodies too. But we need to be properly nourished to do that. Um, I have a list of vitamins and minerals that in my fats and oils book, Fats and Oils Demystified, again, available on my website if you're interested. I have a whole chapter on the conversion of the plant-based omega-3 into EPA and DHA, the reasons why not to take it preformed is that if it's made from fish oil, it's two things, rancid and polluted. And the rancidity can contribute to malaldehyde, uh, adducts and DNA and cancer. This is very bad, as Udo Erasmus would certainly agree. And then the uh, pollution is just epic. Now, some brands try and reduce the pollution, but that's all they do. So there is another possibility. You can get algae-based DHA, the algae-based DHA does not have the pollution problem, but it's still likely to be very rancid. If we make it in our own bodies from freshly ground flaxseed, it's not rancid, it's not polluted, which is how I prefer to do it. If you're also making sure that your nutrition is good, you need certain B vitamins, certain minerals, you need to get just generally good nutrition and you can make it in your body. And it's been found that most Americans make most of their EPA in their body as opposed to eating it even those that eat fish. Okay, and we've got about two more minutes. We're gonna get one more question from the audience, so, but if we can keep it real short. Um, JB, please ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. I'm wondering about the saturated fat and dark chocolate. I understand coconut uh, saturated fat is not good. I don't I heard chocolate was kind of neutral. And also is sugar as inflammatory as animal fat? Oh, good questions. Uh, I can say nothing bad about chocolate. It does contain some saturated fat and we do need to limit it to a reasonable amount. Of course, I like the dark chocolate, which doesn't have milk fat mixed in. And no, despite certain very prestigious doctors harping on the inflammatory potential of sugar, it doesn't touch arachidonic acid, lipopolysaccharides or AGEs or... <laughs> Any of these other things are vastly more inflammatory than sugar. I, of course, sugar needs to be taken in reasonable quantities and not that 12 teaspoons in a glass of soda. Uh, too much is too much. But inflammation, no. And I have not seen research that shows why they're saying that. I've heard it over and over and over again. 
but it's not clear at all that sugar increases inflammation. Sugar damages in many ways, of course, aggravates diabetes, for example. Great. Great. And, uh, any, we have like one more minute left. Any last final thoughts you want to leave the audience with? Well, I want to thank you. And I want to thank the caregivers of the Parkinson's folks, because that's a tough position to be in. And I hope that you can help the people you're caring for to make these changes, see them get better see the result of reducing protein to needed levels and the improvement in tremors and movement potential and the improvements in constipation and all the other things. So my goal is to make your life as caretakers easier and of course the life of people with Parkinson's easier. And that's why I'm volunteering here today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So much really great information. Let's please unmute the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.